Welcome to FYI, the four-year innovation podcast. This show offers an intellectual discussion on technologically enabled disruption, because investing in innovation starts with understanding it. To learn more, visit arc-invest.com. Arc Invest is a registered investment advisor focused on investing in disruptive innovation. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. It does not constitute either explicitly or implicitly any provision of services or products by ARC. All statements made regarding companies or securities are strictly beliefs and points of view held by ARC or podcast guests and are not endorsements or recommendations by ARC to buy, sell, or hold any security. Clients of ARC Investment Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Hi, everyone, and welcome to FYI, the For Your Innovation Podcast. I'm Thomas Hartman Boyce, Client Portfolio Manager here at ARK Invest. And joining me today is Flo Berberich, Associate Director at ARK Europe. Flo is a new member of ARK's team through the RISE ETF acquisition covering the DAX region. So welcome, Flo. Delighted to have you on today. And frankly, I couldn't think of a better co-host for today's topic. Thank you, Thomas. Lovely to be here and really looking forward to the session. And of course, we have the guest of honor today, uh, Frank uh, Thalen the founder and CEO of Frygas Capital, as well as the CEO of 10X DNA. Frank, welcome to the show. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. And maybe first things first, I'd like to give our listeners, especially in the United States, who may not know you as well as, as in Europe and in Germany, some background. Can you describe a little bit about what you do, what you're well known for, and what you're focused on right now on a day-to-day basis? Absolutely. So yeah, I, I'm Frank. I'm um, here in, in Bonn, uh, Germany, a European entrepreneur. So I started um, my career in um, founding uh, startups in, in, in Germany, uh, started with in the CD-ROM era. So when there was no mainstream internet, then created a couple of, of internet uh, companies, a lot of failures along the way, um, but also some successes. And right now I have two companies called Freigeist Capital. That's a seed investor in, in European tech startups. So we focus on, on deep tech. And then we have a 10X DNA where we also invest in uh, public equity in tech companies globally. And Frank, in addition to your background, the story behind how you met our CEO, CIO slash founder, Kathy Wood, is interesting. You know, with much regret, I wasn't at the event. I heard it was a lot of fun and I wish I were there. But I believe it was the Bits and Pretzels Founders Festival in Munich, which is held during Oktoberfest. Could you talk a bit about the event, your interaction with Kathy and, and you know, in other words, what got us here? <laughs> Absolutely. So, yeah, it's a lot of fun. It's called Oktoberfest. I believe it's it's known globally. It's a it's a big party, actually. And uh, Kathy even put on a dirndl. Uh, that, that's a, that's a, a local fashion thing. So you can also find some some photos of, of her and me in that special uh, Munich outfit. Yeah, that, and the conference is called Bits and Bratzels. And that's where, uh, yeah, we bring bring a lot of the, the founders, the investors, the, the scene together and uh, discuss about technology and yeah she luckily uh, joined us joined us uh, at this conference and we had a pretty good time awesome well with that as the quick intro we have a lot of topics to cover together and of course the key focus today will be on the european perspective of disruptive innovation and technology given your background and we could certainly hone in on your home base of germany and this is a, a fact that probably uh flo nor you frank know And that is that Germany is the fifth ranked country for all time FYI podcast listens. So I know ARC's audience will definitely be excited about these topics. And I'm sure we have some entrepreneurs uh, tuning in. So I'll start with an important question. And it's a topic that is near and dear to ARC's core ethos and investment philosophy, as well as yours. And that is this mutual focus we have on exponential growth. And, And Frank, you talk about linear versus exponential growth and how it's hard for the human mind to wrap its head around this concept of exponential growth. Could you elaborate a little bit more on this and and, uh, how it relates to disruptive innovation and technology? Yeah, we're we're coming into an exponential um, age where uh, I call it the toolbox of the future. Oh, you haven't want to call it like all those great technologies that we know. So we have AI, we have 3D printing, we have 5G, 6G, 
a blockchain and all these things. And these are coming together and they will and have already uh, unleashed completely new ways of, of building corporations and how you grow. And especially in, in, in Germany, we are quite successful in optimizing linearly. So not exponentially, but saying we built the best washing machine, we built the best uh, coffee maker, and we go step by step and we have this, this, this famous Spaltmaß so that everything is really perfect. But we're not good in understanding how the world is changing now in a very different way. And for example, if it comes to uh, digitization, we are really lost behind. So we're not fast. We're not adapting like the U.S., like, like other countries, but we're stick to what is great in production and so on and still healthy. But I'm worried about the, the future. And that's especially a thing of the, the mindset in, in Germany. What I try to educate people here, change is coming. It starts slowly, but then it will grow rapidly. And for us, for example, the, 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 the car industry with Mercedes, BMW, Porsche, all those big brands that you know, and especially all those smaller uh, companies that deliver parts uh, through that um, industry is really, really important for us. So um, it, it, it's crucial for us that, that we keep it. And currently with Tesla, where we both are invested in, we see that we might lose this important industry in Germany very fast and very soon. So that's what I'm, I'm talking about and try to educate people here to understand that there, there's change in an exponential way uh, coming globally. And, you know, here at ARC, uh, as you know, we, we certainly agree with this concept of exponential growth, the disruption that comes with it. Um, and here at ARC, you know, we focus specifically on five innovation platforms that we defined, you know, some of which you've already listed here, artificial intelligence, robotics, energy storage, multiomics or genomics, and blockchain technology. And you mentioned you use the term coming together. And I think you'd agree the convergences between and among these platforms are definitely part of what is contributing to this explosive growth that we're, that we're talking about. And you've already hit on, on the auto uh, industry and Tesla. And that's actually a, a prime example in terms of that company, not just being an auto manufacturing company, but really embodying this convergence between energy storage in terms of battery pack systems, obviously powering electric vehicles with robotics in terms of autonomous vehicles, the potential for full self-driving. You know, they're, they're getting over a million miles per day in terms of autonomous miles logged. And then, of course, AI in terms of the brains behind autonomous driving. So could you talk a little bit more about some of the convergences that you're focused on and, and what are you observing uh, specifically in Europe? Sure. So especially did this, this where these technologies get combined, for example, 3D printing. 3D printing in itself is a great technology, but when you add AI capabilities, then you can create complete new products which were not possible before. And then you might even add IoT so that things are connected and maybe stored and managed on a blockchain so that it can learn while your parts that you've been just printed are used in the field. So things are coming together and then you create companies like Tesla that 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 exactly see this way. So um and work this way. Like, like when we look at the car industry, for example, it's still a great manufacturing companies, but they don't have their own chips. They don't have their own software platform. They did not understand how important that is. And uh, that's that's quite a uh, quite a challenge. On the other side, we have quite good research uh, in, in, in Germany and Europe. So we have great universities um, that really deliver. But then we don't have the same thinking of founders that create the companies with a bigger vision. And also when it comes especially to later financing rounds, we still lag behind with a capital, which is quite important if you want to build a really big mission like a rocket, satellite, a new generation of, of cars and so on. So we lack the capital in Europe and that's uh, quite a challenge. Well, education and talent and, and capital are all questions and topics that we want to hit on today. Um, but let's start at a higher level. Uh, in terms of Europe and flow, I, I think no better person to to you know tee off this conversation on the European ecosystem uh, than you, given your focus at Arc Europe. So, Flo, let me pass it over to you. Sure thing. Thank you, Thomas. So, and maybe as you mentioned, maybe let's do start at a high level, um, Frank. So, the state of the European ecosystem. Clearly, there's a lot of innovation happening in the US, just like you mentioned. Maybe Germany or Europe is sometimes considered 
slightly behind the curve when it comes to innovation, digitalization, etc. Um, is there anything that you see in Europe that would really have to change to foster a more innovative environment that's supporting those companies that are driving disruption specifically in Europe? Yes. So Europe has a lot of potential and it, it, it's not all bad. For example, as I mentioned, we have really great universities, we have really great uh, research. And we also have some of the, the, the first companies that, that, that globally uh, create great products or are leading in new industries like Lilium Aviation and the eVTOL industry. We just uh, recently announced Aleph Alpha as a competitor or also player in the market for um, for large language models. They received 500 million. It's not the same size round as the US, but for Europe, it's 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 quite good. We are building two, uh, we have good two rocket uh, startups. We are working on fusion uh, energy. So we have some promising startups and we have um, a healthy ecosystem that is also growing. But when you compare it to US or also China with a very different approach, we're still lacking behind. So we don't have that, that, that thriving ecosystem. We have a good ecosystem that's growing, but the global competition is moving much faster. So we need to wake up uh, in Europe. It's very important. And also from politicians to the big corporates, um, we need to understand how important it is that we now invest more into the future uh, and into uh, technologies because we are currently living out of the, like the car industry, the, the older industries that have been quite strong in Germany. But what will define the future, as, as you know at ARC, are different companies, different technologies. We're coming into uh, new ways of, of uh, yeah, disruption. And um, here I see the big challenge out of Europe. We need to be much faster. We need to invest much more capital um, yeah, to stay alive in the, in the next 10 to 20 years. Thank you very much for that, Frank. Maybe as we already discussed, you know, with the state of digitization in Germany, every time I go there, let's take fintech as an example. You know, I have to check with the cab driver every time whether I can pay by card or not, because otherwise he won't let me go at the end if I don't have cash. So that's quite a good example how slow certain simple, you know, <laughs> innovative strategies like card payments, fintech, etc., are pretty slow in Germany. What, so do you see any aspects in the economy where maybe the consumer, et cetera, would have to sort of change their behaviors a bit and they're sort of being more accepted to change and disruptive innovation that might obviously help the overall economy, productivity, et cetera? Well, there are several aspects. To this. First is that that we as, as as German, we are a Bedenkenträger, as you say. So we always see something that you're, you're nodding. So you always see like something that could go wrong. And and then when we have all this data, we say, oh, if somebody misuses the data. But it's so much more important to also see the upside, all the possibilities. And for example, the advantages of, of paying with Apple Pay or Samsung Pay or Google Pay or whatever, digital, and use the blockchain for uh, for equity and, and so on. So we have a lot of Bedenkenträger in, in Germany that say, oh, that's very dangerous. But also when you can't look in, into our, our current uh, government, they are some, there are few modern people that really want to push digitization, but there are many also that say, hey, paper is totally fine. It works. Why don't we need all this, this new stuff? And then when it comes to regulations, we are also not, not that uh, progressive. We, for example, invested in, in, into a company. We wanted to bring equity on the blockchain, on the Ethereum platform. I believe this makes perfect sense. We launched a company. Uh, we also had the first successes with Porsche and so on. And then the regulator really stepped in and say, oh, we don't know if we really want to have this here in Germany and grow that fast. And, and, and regulations really pushed back and um, the company had, had to shut down. So it's, it's not an environment where people are excited. If you go, for example, to China, the people see the possibilities. The people see what might work in the future. And they're excited about all these new possibilities. So we have to change the mindset of, of the German uh, people. And that's why I also wrote the book uh, 10x DNA to really tell an easy, understandable story, explain why this, is, uh, why this has so many benefits and that we should embrace it and not be afraid about it. 
I'd certainly agree because it, it, it seems like that in Germany that they're a bit more reluctant to sometimes, you know, embrace certain changes that would potentially make everyone's life easier, right? And another question that came to mind, Frank, is because, of course, with the European Union, there's a lot of funding grants available for all type of companies working in different sectors. Sometimes when I heard you on other podcasts around you read around the, you know, entrepreneur space in Europe, it, wouldn't it be more helpful for some companies if, say, the, the open competition in the market was rather there than just being able to get a grant for everything, but you're then not able to participate, you know, in large government contracts, etc., which would actually be more beneficial for some of these companies to get a foot in the door and grow their businesses? How do you see that? Are there many, maybe too many grants, etc., available and not enough actual market opportunities for small companies in Europe? I mean, grants are, are always tricky, especially if uh, politicians then have to have to run run a program. We just have a very big program in the U.S., the Reduction Inflation Act, which is uh, the ridiculous name. Um, but uh, we are they also pushing quite heavily to build battery factories and so on, which in general I believe is a is a good idea. So there need to be a European answer. In general, I like a healthy market where private money can can finance the, the right things. And it's always tricky if the gov government really push some special programs for some, some uh, industries. But we are in a, in a situation, for example, in, in Germany, where we need to be uh, energy independent. So um, I believe politicians now have to jump in and put some funding in place so that we can have our own solar industry, that we can have our own energy storage uh, industry. Uh, is there um, too much in, in Europe? I don't think so. I believe there are the wrong programs. Um, when you look about how, how much money we put into fusion energy, uh, into, uh, into solar, uh, into next generation internet companies and so on, I believe the programs should currently be bigger, uh, but we have currently the, 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 wrong, the wrong programs in place. Excellent. And I guess this leads into um, something that was discussed earlier. Obviously, there are a lot of areas of innovation or innovation platforms where the US might be miles ahead of Europe. Um, is there a specific area with regards to innovation where you think Europe has the best chance to catch up or actually get ahead with regards to, you know, that particularly industry or type of innovation where you could see maybe also, you know, the first trillion dollar company actually coming out of Europe rather than, you know, obviously always the US. Um, is, is there an area of innovation where you see them, you know, Europe or specifically Germany actually on the front foot? I believe we, we could utilize our uh, manufacturing uh, skills uh, because we, we are still building some of the, the, the best cars, not from the software side and, and battery technology. But if you look at the manufacturing quality, what, what we're doing here, um, Germany is still leading. And that's something where we can build on. You could think about robotics. Uh, where we could have some some uh, great companies. We see it, for example, with uh, Lilium Aviation, the eVTOL company, where we're really benefiting from, from all the suppliers that, that can uh, deliver uh, high-quality uh, uh, parts, where normally when we build a startup in Europe, we already uh, always have this disadvantage of not having a big social um, network, not having the leading search, not having... Um, leading cloud infrastructure. So that's the first time I see really Europe has the benefit of all these uh, manufacturing um, capabilities. It could be biotech. Uh, we, when, when you look at the, the current vaccine, it basically came out of, out of Germany. Uh, we could thrive here. Yeah, but uh, we really have to make a plan and, and see where, is the, where are the possibilities of Europe. And currently, I don't see that push that politicians also think strategically where where's our strength and how we can be where can we be part of that new disruptive wave uh, that that's coming brilliant thank you frank and i think that gives us a great opportunity to dive into the next question because obviously we talk about innovation where you can get on the front foot one of the key things you need for that is the talent you know to obviously drive innovation entrepreneurship etc and i think that's a topic that's something you're very passionate about. Arc is obviously very passionate about that too. Um, how do you see the potential to sort of foster an ecosystem where innovation can flourish? Um, what do you think is required for that with regards to tools, resources, maybe on university level to really get ahead when it comes to, you know, that talent that can really be, 
you know, the next innovators, the next entrepreneurs to, to drive us ahead? It might sound um, strange, but I believe we need stars. When I look, for example, in Germany, we had Boris Becker and Steffi Graf. They were the best tennis players. So when you look at them into our tennis clubs, they were full and there were a lot, a lot of next generation tennis players. The same for soccer. Uh, we have been or are, I don't know, quite good in, in, in soccer. So we have many young people that admire and, and really work hard to become a great soccer player. But who is our star when it comes to building rockets, uh, satellites, next biotech technology, um, software? So you, in, for example, in the US, you have Elon Musk, you have Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, where we believe is a, is a great entrepreneur where you say, I want to become the next Bill Gates. I want to become the next Elon Musk. And, it, it, and that's quite important. So we need in Europe the next generation of stars that say, I built this perfect plane. I built this rocket. I built this leading biotech uh, technology that, that's actually healing cancer. Um, and then more people will, will get excited about it. So uh, these, these, these stars where you look up to and say, I want to be the next uh, whatever, founder, uh, that, that's quite important. It's also uh, missing still in Europe. Yeah, I guess if you wanted to be sarcastic, you could have said we had Wirecard who did exactly the opposite when it comes to uh, when, it, when it comes to heaven stars. But yeah, l l let's not continue on that one. But there's also we work in the US. So <laughs> failures, <laughs> failures, <laughs> both ecosystems have a lot of failures. No, I, I think that was really great. And with regards to universities itself, obviously, you, you, you cannot just create a star overnight, Frank, right? Um, is there anything you can do on a university level? I obviously remember when I went to university here in Britain, but I remember I did a module which was called Entrepreneurial Opportunity. And the entire point of that was develop a business idea and put it into action, which is was actually something I really enjoyed. Let's not talk about the idea I did, but you know, um, is that something you think you, that can be done more on university level, especially in Germany, to 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 help that sort of desire to wanting wanting to be an entrepreneur and you know innovate and find new ways of doing things? Um, absolutely, but that's I believe Germany is quite strong in that area. That, that's some of the parts where we really uh, really are strong. So we have the, the TUM in, in Munich. Uh, we have Aachen. Uh, we have in Karlsruhe called KIT. Um, so we have uh, strong universities with strong technology backgrounds. Great founders are created there. So that's something that really has evolved in, in, in Germany. But um, we are lacking then creating the real companies that then, then thrive. So the research and universities are quite strong, a good ecosystem that have been built over the last 10 years, but we are still lacking the, 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 the skill then to create great and, and bigger uh, companies. So Frank, I think you, you bring up a lot of uh, important points in terms of education, in terms of talent from stars to university. You know, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention, you know, one thing we're doing uh, here specifically in the U.S., and we've started in Pinellas County, uh, which is in Florida, where our headquarters are, is an initiative through something called the Innovation Foundation, where we're trying to incorporate um, uh, education around the the five different innovation platforms that I mentioned. AI is a, is a really good example into really early education from early childhood through middle school. So when folks are you know approaching high school and that university level, they already have a really strong foundation in terms of knowledge relating to these areas. And obviously, we both agree that over the next 10 plus years, these innovation platforms, these underlying technologies are going to shape the world meaningfully. And frankly, they're going to be where jobs become uh, attractive and, and lucrative. And again, to shape the minds and, and to, to bring knowledge to folks from an early age, we think is incredibly important. And I imagine just naturally, more and more curriculums will incorporate these innovations, these technologies over time, but we think it's important to get that started now ahead of this wave of innovation. Um, with that, I'll, I'll pivot a, a little bit from the education side and talent over to financing uh, technology, financing the next generation of technology. And, and Frank, I know this has been something you've focused on and, and you mentioned your, your different hats that you wear. You know, One of them is focusing on early stage private companies can you talk a bit about the opportunity you see in private and your venture efforts that you're undertaking and, and how funding from a private lens is important for innovation? 
exactly. So yeah, we're doing um, seed investments in deep tech in, in Europe, and um, we see a lot of great deals. So that's not the challenge uh, here in, in Germany or, or in Europe. So we have the, the strong universities. We have the strong first generation of founders that have good ideas. And uh, yeah, we, we're happy to, to invest in them. The challenge in our ecosystem are the late stage rounds. So if then you have the bold idea of healing cancer, building a rocket, building something totally new, and it works after our, our seed investment and maybe series A, and then you need to 100 million plus checks. That's a challenge in Europe. We don't have the ecosystem. So the seed environment, I believe, is quite great through the universities, and, and we have a lot of great, uh, great deal flow. That's interesting. You know, we, we found here at ARC, um, you know, kind of a, a similar takeaway in the sense that when it comes to uh, pre-IPO, you know, a lot of companies will be supported from private players, but once they IPO, they'll often, as you'd imagine, based off the investment structure, abandon that investment or be forced uh, to exit that investment. And from our lens, it, it makes sense. And I think you'd agree, right, that these companies should be supported through their entire life cycle from kind of early stage, seed stage to pre-IPO, which sounds like is the piece that's uh, potentially missing uh, over in, in Germany in terms of support there, but also once they become public. And in the public equity markets, you know, clearly time horizons are shortened meaningfully such that people are very focused on quarter over quarter as opposed to keeping a, a five, 10 year time horizon in mind for the potential that these companies could have. And in innovation in particular, it's incredibly important to maintain that five-year time horizon, that long-term time horizon. Well, of course, you know, being sensitive to developments that are happening in real time on a shorter on a shorter basis. Uh, but again, you know, keeping that long-term time uh, horizon intact. So I don't know if there's anything you want to add in terms of thinking about that in terms of the entire life cycle of of companies, uh, in particular over in Europe. Absolutely. When you look into Europe, for example, when you when you look at the the SPACs that that you had in in, in the US, and, and you can say uh, some were too progressive, but in general, I believe we all agree it was a good idea to bring capital to new new ideas, and uh, we only had two or three in, in in Germany because the regulations were so complicated, and we had our first um, IPO with our with a seed investment from us that was also a US SPAC because basically in in, in, in Germany there were no SPACs, and then when you look at um, the people. Do they invest in equity? Could even be bigger companies. So do, so do they have equity a, as part of their in investment strategy in general? Uh, only very few people in, in Germany do it because they are afraid um, about the volatility. So we were not a very progressive equity in investing uh, people here in Germany. Quite the opposite. So we, we like, like the safety. So this also has to change. So we have to open up our IPO market so that after the series C, D, when the, when the company is successful, we have this opportunity to go to the stock market. And also then we need more people that are willing to invest in the stock market so that that equity is, uh, is attractive. So there's also uh, yeah, still a lot of room to, to improve here in, uh, in Germany. Appreciate that, Frank. And, and Flo, I would love your perspective here in terms of what we're talking about, um, private versus public, but as well as at a higher level, you know, how are you and your team thinking about the opportunity in Europe? Can you talk maybe a bit about uh, the focus areas that you have? Absolutely, absolutely. Well, first of all, we all here, you know, at Rise or now Arc Europe, we couldn't have been more excited about, you, you know, the acquisition and essentially, you know, um, the joining of forces with Arc because something we've been doing at Rise is obviously in the mega trend thematic space. If you look at us on paper, you know, we have a core focus on innovative ETFs no one else has done before. We have a core focus on sustainability. We have a core focus on working with research teams. That's everything Arc does as well in the US. So we all really excited for this joint future because obviously our DNA is pretty similar. And as you mentioned at the start, I think, what was the figure with regards to European listeners of this podcast, Thomas? Yeah, the fifth um, most listens in terms of uh, regions uh, for the FYI podcast come from Germany. Exactly. So if you take that number, and I think roughly one quarter of your research subscribers also come out of Europe, which just shows there really is some interest in 
you know, educating yourself, reading about Arc's work when it comes to innovation platforms, etc. So now having the ability to go out, you know, and make Arc as a company, their investment ethos more tangible for especially investors in Germany is something we are particularly excited about. I just came back from a little road trip, been in Frankfurt, Munich, Cologne, Dusseldorf, Vienna, and it, the feedback's been so positive, right? Because obviously there's a lot of coverage. I know, Frank, you will obviously know that as well. What you do, what Ark and Kathy does is something um, that attracts a lot of attention, right? Um, and we obviously really, really excited to meet with our investors, meet with potential clients to really get them to understand how Arc works, what's behind the name, what's behind the company. And that's something that's already been received you know, really positively. So so me personally, I'm really excited about that. And I guess another factor is if we look at active ETF numbers in Europe, how they have developed, obviously a really fast grown space. So bringing that to Europe in the thematic space, which doesn't really exist yet, they're usually, you know, broad benchmarks that exist as active ETFs so far, is another thing, you know, Frank will know, active management is something that's what, especially Germany, is really focused on a huge amount of assets are with active management type of styles. So going into that market with an ETF product, which obviously what we've been done for a very long time now, is very exciting for us. And I guess just in general, the general way asset allocation is working, we've seen it with thematics and mega trend portfolios. It's not like it used to be with, okay, we have a sector allocation or we have a geographical allocation. Portfolio managers are really now starting to see that they're, you know, they're building blocks for their portfolio, which are cross-sectorial, which really capture certain mega trends they want to allocate to in their portfolios, whether, you know, it's a hedge for future disruption of the technology allocation, whether it's getting access to a certain sustainability, you know, topic or theme. That's something that really has changed the perception on what thematics, mega trend, innovative strategies can do in a portfolio. And, you know, I can only see it going upwards from here. So, you know, I think now is the perfect time to continue this journey. And um, I couldn't be more excited about it. And I guess, Thomas, we will be working a lot closer together as well when you can, <laughs> when you join us in London for some of our trips. I can't wait for that. Um, and Frank, uh, I want to give you an opportunity to piggyback off of those comments because I think Flo brought up a, a few really important points. You know, and and one is that in, in in regards to innovation in particular, it moves very quickly. And you know, having just a, a plain vanilla market cap exposure, in our view, and I believe your view as well, isn't necessarily the right way. Again, based off our research, to access. Uh, innovation because innovation often falls outside of the indices to you know to flow's point we're talking about you know cross sector impact we're talking about different size segments uh global opportunity set and again often the the indices have very kind of low overlap between the types of technologies and the types of companies that we invest in have you found uh that to be the case as well uh frank here curious uh in terms of your viewpoints here Absolutely. So the Magnificent Seven, they, they drive the, the indices, and I believe it's, uh, it's a great time to be an, an active uh, manager, to have a proprietary um, research, um, have, have names and, and holdings in, inside um, that, that are not well known and that will be the next generation and they have, have a brighter future. So absolutely, I believe uh, it's now a great time to, to invest in technology in, uh, with, with, with deep research and deep understanding with a longer uh, time horizon. And uh, yeah, and uh, so absolutely agree. It's a, it's a good time to be in the market. You know, Frank, in terms of your background, there's one thing that we didn't discuss that I think is, is frankly uh, fascinating. And we were talking about education and, and obviously putting out research is central to that in terms of uh, putting out research on the technologies we're interested in, how we're thinking about them, how you're thinking about them. But one thing in terms of your background is that you've spent time on Germany's version of uh, Shark Tank. And I probably shouldn't even say Germany's version because I believe the, the concept of having entrepreneurs you know, present to, to VCs uh, on air, uh, on, on TV, started in Japan in around 2001, and then entered uh, Germany next. 
uh, in 2005, so before Shark Tank here in the U.S. Do you want to talk about kind of your experience um, on that on that show, and, and specifically, you know, some investments that you heard that 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 may have worked out, or others that didn't? Kind of any lessons in particular for for entrepreneurs that may be tuning in today. Absolutely. So yeah, no, the, the it's kind of the same family. It's Sony who, who made the production. It started in Japan, then went to, to the US and then, then Germany. And uh, I believe it's, it's, it's quite a great show because it, it shows a, a broad audience what it means to build a startup. And it just brings those, you could also be an entrepreneur into the living rooms. And, and that's why, why I joined uh, uh, the show. Um, honestly, it was uh, it was seven years in that show. It was even more successful in the U.S. So it's a it's a it's a crazy successful show here here in, in Germany, and and I believe it's great because um, people get more excited about uh, about this and and understand better how they can create a, a product, a startup, and then then uh, they make the first steps as an entrepreneur. And uh, we also created some some meaningful companies out of this. So the the the, the most of the investments I did was what in, in the food uh, space, and we're generating uh, several hundred millions of revenue out of the show. So uh, also here in Germany, uh, Shark Tank is is quite successful. That's actually quite an interesting point, Frank, because we obviously um, at Rise one of our you know um, really interesting strategies we speak in a lot about is sustainable future of food. And you mentioned you you had one in the food space. Obviously, that area had quite a tough time, maybe, say, the last year or so. Um, it'd be really interesting to hear your views on, you know, the future of food theme or investment area, because it's one you can't really deny. It's everywhere, right? You can see it everywhere. Yet, it seems to be, you know, not quite at the right place yet or being turbocharged just quite yet one of those mega trends so what's your view on that what, what do you see in that space what has to happen first of all yes we we have to 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 make a change here because uh it, it's not sustainable if we keep on on uh, eating real fish and real meat although i, I like it a lot but it, it's not sustainable and we we uh, yeah we have to have to create a lot of great technology here and uh Starting from farming, so having the right robots that also are steered by a big data and, and AI, AI until how and when do we deliver the food to the to the consumer? Uh, there, there are a lot of great opportunities, but yeah, so far it, the market has not been too too appreciating these these things. But I believe um, they will um, yeah thrive very soon because we need them, and there are a lot of great uh, opportunities here and and solutions that can deliver. Healthy food, which is good for my body, with a with a great taste, but also uh, it, it can be part of our an environment friendly way to to live. So yeah, it's a it's a space that we actually love and and invest a lot in. And from our end, you know, we've been focused on, and I was talking about convergences at the beginning of this podcast, but the convergence between artificial intelligence and uh, precision agriculture, and the potential for that uh, to lower farming costs. So. You know, to Flo's point, to, to your point, uh, Frank, I think it's it's a huge area of opportunity and one that ultimately needs to be solved in terms of having you know an impact, a really positive impact on the world. So that is one area that we're we're focused on. But maybe one final uh, question uh, for you, Frank, and I'll continue on the theme of AI. One of your comments a little bit earlier was around pessimism, fear doubt, uncertainty relating to uh, technology, uh, innovation. Um, like like any new uh, invention, there's often a, a pro and a con, the good and the bad. And artificial intelligence has certainly gotten the spotlight uh, in terms of its ability to create a massive productivity uplift, but also potential risks uh, associated to, to artificial intelligence, whether it's misinformation, the potential for AI to be incorporated into Kind of nefarious defense. Uh, so, any any comments you have around again the pros and and the cons for AI? What what we can expect um, in the next couple of years? How you're focusing on this this topic? If there would be a kind of a big red stop button, I might hit it because nobody knows quite frankly where we will go in the next ten to twenty years. But there is no stop button. It's a global thing, and it will just keep on on 
on on growing and there's uh, and 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 the speed is is just just yeah staggering. So I believe we should embrace it. That that's the only way uh, how to handle it, especially in, in 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 Europe, as currently US is is leading. And I believe it's it's quite important that then on a on a global base we discuss the safety of of AI as just have been done in the UK. Um, I believe it was also great that China did uh, join this meeting as well, because I believe it can only be solved globally that we have safe um, AI. So it's, it's it's quite important. We cannot stop it. And then over the next um, years, uh, we will just see a lot of opportunities there in, in, in the companies and our productivity and finding new treatments and, and so on, all those positive, great things. And politicians and leaders globally have to come together like they just did in the UK and discuss again and again and find a framework how we can assure that we make this safe on, on, uh, on, uh, for, for everybody uh, living on this beautiful planet. Well, we would certainly uh, agree with you on, on that front. And, you know, AI often gets its rep in terms of the potential to disrupt jobs. And, and sure, that could happen uh, to some degree. Um, but we think that that human capital will often end up in a better place, similar to uh, farming, uh, you know, 100 plus years back in terms of the advent of, you know, plow, the tractor, et cetera. You know, a, a huge portion of the population here in the U.S., uh, worked at the farm, and now you you obviously have uh, that uh, you know that talent base uh, in all different areas, uh, working on all all different fields. So, um, really, really appreciate uh, your time, Frank, as well as you, Flo. I think this is probably one of the first times we've focused almost entirely on innovation in Europe and and Germany. Um, so, I have to say, probably with a poor accent, uh, Danke uh, for for your contributions. Um, Frank, Flo and I wish you the best, and I'm sure uh, we'll be seeing you, uh, if anything, uh, at Oktoberfest uh, 2024. <laughs> we have a great party. Tom, Flo, thank you so much. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Frank. Liebe Grüße. Ciao. ARC believes that the information presented is accurate and was obtained from sources that ARC believes to be reliable. However, ARC does not guarantee the accuracy or completeness of any information, and such information may be subject to change without notice from ARC. Historical results are not indications of future results. Certain of the statements contained in this podcast may be statements of future expectations and other forward-looking statements that are based on ARC's current views and assumptions, and involve known and unknown risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results, performance, or events to differ materially from those expressed or implied in such statements.